I'm always sick. I'm always out of know. I can't do anything. See all of this. What, what do you expect me to do? Fix it? I'm only ten. I can't even do anything in this world. I just want to be a doctor or anything to help my people, my cat. I'm just a cat. I don't even know what to do. I get scared, but not really that much. I get, I do anything for my people, but I don't know what to do. I'm just 10. I'm just 10. All of this, when I see a little cherry cry every day, saying to myself, why do we deserve this? Why, what did we do to this? Videos like that, especially when they go viral on social media, is part of the reason why I think slowly but surely the tide is beginning to turn when it comes to Israeli apartheid, because we're no longer just being presented with one side of the story. Now, Palestinians can take to social media and actually share their experiences, remind people that they are capable of feeling pain and suffering as well. And it's a lot more difficult to deny the humanity of an entire group of people when it's right up in your face. And so the tide isn't just changing with regard to the sentiment towards the apartheid state of Israel, but we're even beginning to start to see a shift in U.S. media. And we'll talk about the John Oliver segment, which I never would have thought would happen in a million years. But more significant, perhaps, is the response from Democratic Party politicians who aren't mincing words. They're very clear in their unequivocal condemnations of Israel. And I talked about this over the weekend uh, in the Twitch clip that I posted where we talked about this on Thursday. But I want to share a clip from uh, my appearance on TYT where I explain why this is so significant. Look, if you called Israel an apartheid state on air on cable news just a couple of years ago, yeah. you would have been taken off the air for sure. That's, and anybody can that denies it is totally and not living in reality. You couldn't even say occupation on air without issuing some sort of a correction. That was taboo as well. And the beauty of their speeches is that everything that they're saying, like they're not mincing words. They're unequivocally condemning Israel. And that matters. You know, even the folks who disagree with what's happening and aren't peddling the whole, oh, well, Israel has the right to defend itself line. You know, they may not necessarily want to speak up because they know that the Israel lobby is going to bankroll their opponent's campaign come election time. But that's already happening to Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar. So they have nothing to lose at this point. And that's why they're speaking with so much clarity. Uh, yeah. they, don't, they don't care because everything that could have been done against them has already been done. So now you know the, the, the shackles have, have been released and they're just speaking on this issue as it is. And what is happening is apartheid. And to have any member of Congress say the words apartheid truly is a game changer. 100%. Exactly. And to give you some additional context, the best that we got in 2014 during Israel's massacre of Gaza then from a Democratic Party politician was from Jessica Ramos. I don't even think she was actually an elected lawmaker. I think she was just like the chair of the New York City Democrats. But either way, all she posted was a tweet that said Palestine with the heart emoji. And for that, people were calling for her head. That was contentious. Palestine heart emoji was extremely controversial in 2014. But now, lawmakers in the Democratic Party are calling it exactly as it is. They're saying, this is an apartheid regime. And AOC just tweeted out, apartheid states aren't democracies. So they're not just describing the situation accurately. On top of that, they're also holding their peers accountable. So I also talked about how Mark Pocan, on the House floor, he read a quote where he basically states, if you are silent in the face of oppression, then you side with the oppressors. And I've got to say, the silence of many Democratic Party politicians is deafening. But what's nice to see for the first time ever are their colleagues, members of the squad, progressive Democrats, actually calling them out. So, for example, right-wing Democrat Richie Torres, he took to the New York Post to write an op-ed where he basically pretends to be courageous by going against the Twitter mob and defending Israeli apartheid. 
but he's not doing this on Twitter. So he's doing this on a platform where he is protected from the quote unquote Twitter mob. But his colleague Jamal Bowman called him out for this saying, my brother Richie, this is not about a Twitter mob. This is about justice, humanity, and equality. This is about Palestinians deserving peace, land, and self-determination like everyone else. This is about Palestinians having their land and homes taken from them and our ignorance of Palestinian pain. That is the truth, my brother. So to actually see members of Congress call out the apartheid regime, support BDS explicitly, and on top of that, hold their colleagues accountable and call out their lies about the situation, this is a paradigm shift. This is incredibly new. And what really makes it seem like things are different is to see segments like this on major television networks in the United States. Lots is complicated here, but some things are pretty simple. One side is suffering much more. And if America really wants to help, it might want to seriously consider changing its long-held position here. Because for decades, the backbone of America's policy in the Middle East has been that America is an unwavering friend to Israel, which is a great thing to try and be. But at the end of the day, I would hope that a real friend would tell me when I'm being an asshole, and definitely when I'm committing a f***ing war crime. Let me just say that if you followed politics back in 2014 and you followed Israel's massacre of Gaza back then, to see a segment like this on television, it would have broke the internet. But now this is becoming more and more common. And Ali Velchi of MSNBC, a network that is usually biased and just toes the line of the Democratic Party establishment, he came out and said what I didn't think I'd ever hear a pundit on mainstream media say. Palestinians are, at best, third-class citizens in the nation of their birth. The idea that it's even remotely controversial to call what Israel has imposed on Palestinians a form of apartheid is laughable. One look at a current map of Israel, Gaza, and the occupied territories conjures up only one other example, apartheid-era South Africa. The Israeli government, on an ongoing basis, declares parcels of land on which Palestinians live to be either of military or archaeological importance, causing residents to be evicted. Sometimes there's a court case, and almost always the Palestinians lose. Yet months or weeks later, that same important land suddenly becomes home to a brand new Israeli settlement. As more and more Jewish settlers take over land on which Arabs live, the occupied West Bank becomes de facto more Israeli and in the explicit hopes of the Israeli government, more Jewish. This is a long-standing attempt and a deliberate attempt to force Arabs who have lived in that land sometimes for hundreds of years out. It's an attempt to dilute their presence because to have Arabs as full participants is in the opinion of the Israeli government and their courts diluting Israel. Just prior to the pandemic, I toured many of the contested areas and homes from which Arabs are being pushed out, both in Israel proper and in the occupied territories. Palestinians don't control the important parts of their lives. Palestinian families are refused permits to build or renovate their homes. When they connect their homes to the municipal water supply, Israeli soldiers sometimes cut the pipes. When they attempt to harness solar energy because their homes are not on the grid, Israeli soldiers literally come and remove solar panels from their homes. I spent an hour and a half traveling alongside an elderly Palestinian woman who was being transferred between three ambulances from Gaza to the no man's land in between and then into Israel to get cancer treatment. Three ambulances over the course of one mile, more than an hour to cross the border. That's how Gazans live, without medical treatment because Israel prevents it, without electricity much of the time because Israel prevents it, without the ability to fish in the Mediterranean Ocean because Israel prevents it, without an airport or a seaport because Israel prevents it. Like Israelis, Palestinians also have a right to exist and to defend themselves, but there is no one willing to help them do that, not the Israeli courts and not the U.S. government. What the U.S. also shares with Israel is the belief that Hamas, the political party that governs Gaza, is a terrorist organization that calls for the destruction of Israel. Hamas is supported by the majority of Palestinians in Gaza. Hamas may not be in the best long-term interests of the Gazans, but peace hasn't really worked out for them. Faced with an Israeli government which pens them into what has been called the world's largest open-air prison, they have chosen a government that most of us wouldn't prefer, one that is not given to negotiation and moderation and respect for its neighbor. Israel needs a new approach to the Palestinians, and America needs a new approach to Israel.
After more than seven decades of not just being deprived of land from which they were evicted, Palestinian frustration runs deep. It may be worth going deeper than what you may hear inside your bubble and understanding the depth to which the Palestinian people are subject to apartheid in their own land, deprived of basic necessities and subject to relentless civil rights violations. This is not a secret. It's out there for you to see. You just have to look for it. By now, I'm sure that you've seen this segment, but I've got to say I had to share it at length because... This is truly remarkable, and I am usually one to argue that words don't really amount to much, but when it comes to this issue, we have had so little progress that to see such a gigantic shift in rhetoric and tone is truly a game changer. It's really incredibly important. So I don't know what it is. Again, perhaps it's videos from social media of Palestinians like the one that we saw of that 10-year-old Palestinian girl. Perhaps Israel has gone just a little bit too brazen with the war crimes, bombing buildings that house Associated Press journalists. I don't necessarily know, but I will tell you this. Something feels different, and we're finally beginning to wake up when it comes to this issue collectively as a country, I think. It's the beginning, but it's a really important start. And what I would recommend to everyone who's watching this, who's still trying to both sides it or sides with Israel as they literally carry out an ethnic cleansing, it is not too late to get on the right side of history. The tide is turning and history is seeing this as it really is. So it's not too late for you. You can get on the right side of history and you can actually open your heart and understand what's happening to the Palestinian people and you could stand in solidarity with human beings who just want to live on their land, who want to stop being evicted from their homes, who have a right to not be slaughtered by a far-right extremist government that wants an ethnostate. And I'll leave that there. It's not too late for you. Get on the right side of history while you still can, because I can guarantee you that the folks who are on the wrong side of history when it comes to South African apartheid, now they probably feel very embarrassed about their decision to support that atrocity. Individuals who were against gay marriage and gay rights in the 80s and 90s are now very embarrassed, I'd imagine, about their position. And we know exactly where this issue is headed as well. So it's not too late. Actually open your heart and more importantly, educate yourself and support the Palestinian people in their struggle for self-determination and to exist.